Well, today we are going to be wrapping up our sermon series that's been on the I Am Statements of Jesus. We know that next Sunday is Palm Sunday and, and then Holy Week and Easter Sunday coming up. And so today we end this journey that we have been making with Jesus all across the Sundays of Lent. And for de- today, to really set this passage in its time and place in the life and ministry of Jesus, we are skipping ahead in the story. We, we're in that last week of Jesus' life. We're, we're on Monday, Thursday when this takes place. And so there he and his disciples are in the upper room in Jerusalem. And they have eaten their meal together. And now they've reached the point in the evening when Jesus says that he wants to leave. He wants to go out from that place and to move on with what's to come that night. I don't know about y'all, but We know where the story is going next. We know what lies awaiting him outside that door when he leaves the upper room and travels down and, and continues through his evening. We know what's coming. He did too. The difference is most of us, our our human survival instinct would have us, rather than saying to the disciples, it's time for us to go, we would be saying, it's time for us to board up the door. They will have to come and fight to get me out of here because we know what's about to happen. Jesus does too. And he doesn't ask the disciples to board up the door. He doesn't try to hold up to save his life. Instead, he says time it's time for them to go. He knows that he won't be going to sleep that night. He knows that the minutes are ticking by. And he knows that time is running out. And so they're, they're getting up from the table to leave. And they go out of the upper room. And then they're traveling. Ultimately, the disciples feel or think that they're traveling back to Bethany. Bethany is where they've been staying. Around the home of, either in or around the home of Lazarus and Mary and Martha and Bethany. And Bethany is just over the hilltop of the Mount of Olives. And, and it's a bit of a walk. And so as they leave out, that's where they, the disciples think that they're all heading this evening, as they have every other night, every other day of Holy Week. So they go the shortest distance. You know, we're taught in school, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Well, that's what they do. They know they've got to climb the mountain eventually, and so they climb a smaller mountain first, in a smaller hill, in order to go straight toward the Mount of Olives. They climb the Temple Mount. Their goal is to go onto the Temple Mount, cross through the complex of the Temple, through Solomon's portico, and, and across through the courtyard, and past the Temple itself. And, and then ultimately, they will go through the Eastern Gate and, and down in the Kidron Valley, and then back up the Mount of Olives. But this time, as they're walking through the Temple complex, The great temple standing in front of them. It's white stone gleaming in the moonlight. Jesus begins to talk to them again. And this time he's talking to them about vineyards and vines and branches. In John chapter 15 verse 5 he says to them, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and and I remain in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, when Jesus says this, you have to remember the disciples, as, as young as they were, the disciples would have had a working understanding of vineyards because they were prevalent in that day. The growing of grapes was a, it was a cash crop for anyone who had a vineyard. If you grew wheat, oftentimes you grew it for your own consumption. You may have sold a little, but it wasn't that, it wasn't very expensive. You didn't make much money, but grapes and what you produced from grapes would, well, that, that's where money could be made. So the disciples had an understanding when, when he talks about the vineyard and, and vines and branches, they knew 
that subject matter well. Now, I have to admit, it's vineyards and vines and branches. It's, it's not really a subject matter that I know a lot about. Some of you may have done the wine tours and, and gone through a lot of vineyards over your time and, and seen the beautiful scenery and have that great information stored in your brain. I learned only from reading A Good Year and A Year in Provence. Um, I've toured a couple of vineyards actually in Galilee and saw how they raised the still raised grapes there. Really, the most education I ever received on vines and vineyards and, and all of that came from watching nine seasons of Falcon Crest. I mean, Jane Wyman and Lorenzo Lamas, you know that that show had to be fully accurate. I mean, I learned everything. It, it, was, it was probably solid winemaking information, just like right before it was Dallas. That was solid oil manufacturing information. I, that's how I was educated growing up. But the disciples would have known. They, they knew that in Judea, the, well, the vines are a very rugged crop in one way. And it's a very delicate fruit in another way. And so you have to trim them and prune them very harshly at times. But you also have to treat them with kid gloves at times. A young vine is not permitted to, to bear any fruit for three years. And so in December and January, it requires a harsh pruning, cutting it back to make sure that it doesn't try to produce grapes. But if a particular branch later on doesn't produce fruit or stops producing fruit, well then they're pruned away. To pre preserve the energy of the vine, you're not putting energy into something that's not producing. Because if you do, the crop doesn't produce what it could. So when Jesus talks about vines and vineyards, the disciples understood. They would have understood that metaphor, that image, whenever, wherever they might have been when, if he said it. But remember exactly where they are when he says it this time. When he talks about vines and branches, they are crossing Mount Moriah. They're crossing the Temple Mound. They're standing near the great white stone temple right before them. And there they would have been able to see that around the doorway of the temple, there was a relief carved into the stone, vines and branches and grapes. And because they're there for Passover, a festival, the, the tradition was that when the festivals occurred, the priest would order that the vine and the branch relief around the doorway of the temple that you would take and you would gild that so that it would truly shine. So when the sun would hit the stone of the temple, it would be gorgeous and then it would beam off of that gold gilding on the vine and the branches. And even now, in the candlelight of the temple complex, it had to be twinkling as the disciples looked at it. The vine and the branches carved into stone. You see, for generations, Israel had been known as God's vineyard. That's one of the images of Israel, is the vineyard of the Lord God of hosts. Isaiah the prophet said, The vineyard of the Lord God of hosts truly is the house of Israel. And the prophet Jeremiah said at the one time that God referred to his chosen people, I have planted you as a choice vine. So Israel was that, that choice vine, that true vine, all with roots that go all the way back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But now Jesus is changing that story again. He's, he's flipping that script on them and he's bringing it current. Standing in front of the temple with that, with the starlight and moonlight bouncing off of the, the vine and the branches, Jesus takes the ancient name for God, of God for himself, and he says, Yahweh, I am the vine, and you are the branches. 
And he tells them this story about how God is the one who plants the vineyard and cultivates the vineyard and waters and tends the soil and so that the vine is properly nourished. And he takes pride in the crop. But he also prunes the vines and he removes the dead wood. And the grapes hang on the branches. The disciples had, had to have caught what he was saying. They had to pick up on the meaning of what he's telling them. I am the vine. You are the branches. The disciples had to know that, that their identity, their strength, their present, and their future, it was all in their connection to Jesus. He's the true vine. If, if they break away from him, then they'll be like the unproductive branches. They'll bear no fruit. They'll be of no use. Christ is the vine. The beautiful thing about the I am statements of Jesus, you can bring them clearly forward to our time, to our, our moment here. And Jesus says to us that he is the vine. And now... We, we are the branches. We are the branches. And so we are called to stay that connected to Jesus. That connected to Jesus so that we can bear fruit in his name. And so we, we gather here on Sunday mornings and we go to Sunday school and we participate in small groups and we serve in mission, in mission projects and we go on mission trips and we do all of these things so that we can be nourished. So our soul can be fed. So that we can stay connected to Jesus. And so that we can bear fruit in our homes and in our community and at work and at school and wherever we go. But how do we bear fruit for Jesus? Bearing fruit for Jesus is, well, we find that that's only possible when we are obedient to his word. When we read the Bible and we read the teachings of Jesus and we ask ourselves, how does this apply to my life? And what can I learn from this? How does this challenge me? How does this push me? How does this call me? And we also bear fruit when we learn to follow the promptings of the Holy Spirit that we probably all encounter every day. Those moments when we, we feel like God wants us to do something. That moment when, when it feels like God is, is telling us to, to say something or to do something or to stop or to ask or to say thank you. Or to confront something. Those moments when we, we sort of we feel that within us that, that I need to call them. I need to stop by. I need to run up there. When we become attuned to that and sensitive to that. And when we follow those promptings. It's amazing how we bear fruit in our life. And we bear fruit for the kingdom. Bearing fruit is what Christian discipleship is all about. I mean, truly, we may have the Ten Commandments memorized, you know, backwards and forwards, and, and we might could quote the Sermon on the Mount and not really miss any piece of it. We might have the gift of being a wordsmith, and we can pray prayers that will make the angels weep and the archangel shout hallelujah. But if we aren't living a life that bears fruit for Christ that makes a difference for Christ, then we're missing the meaning of discipleship. If we're not truly making a difference for Christ in our world, at work, at home, at school, with friends, with family, then we're not fully experiencing our purpose in this world as followers of Jesus. C.S. Lewis once wrote, God has designed the human machine to run on himself. He himself is the fuel our spirits were designed to burn. The food our spirits were designed to feed on. There is no other. That's why it's just no good asking God to make us happy without 
bothering about religion. God cannot give us happiness and peace apart from himself because it's not there. There's no such thing. If we truly want to be connected to the vine, to have our souls fed, and to bear fruit for Jesus in our life, then that's going to require us to surrender our will to God's will. To stop seeking our wants and wishes and to ask what God wants of our day and how God wants us to handle this or how God wants to see us move forward in our life or in a situation and actually following that. If we want to be connected to the vine and to have our souls nourished and to bear fruit for Jesus, then we have to follow Jesus' teachings in everyday situations. Knowing what he says and, and applying it in our life. Not just knowing what he says, but then saying to ourselves, but that doesn't really apply here. This is work or this is school or Jesus didn't actually deal with this specific situation. But his lessons come across all situations of life. So where is your fruit? Where are you bearing fruit for Christ in your life? Making a difference for Christ in your world? Some of the things you might ask is, is our church better because you are here? Because you are here with all that God has gifted you bearing fruit for Christ in this place, in this community of faith. Is your home, is work, is school better because you are bearing fruit for Christ in that situation? Are you seeking to make it better? Trying to be the difference in the situation that will make it better. Are you making a difference for Christ? Where is the fruit of your life, of your faith? The issue isn't how much knowledge we have. The issue is, are we staying connected to Christ? Then if we are, are people able to see that? Is it coming through in what I say, in what I do? Is it coming through in how it transforms my life, transforms my relationships? Is it coming through in an attitude of compassion and service and love? Is it coming through in how I live? Because when it does, you're bearing fruit. John Wesley once wrote a sermon that he called the character of a Methodist. And, and he turned it into a tract and, and, and it was widely shared. But in so many ways, it's the character of a Christian, not just the character of a Methodist. And it's the character of anyone who, who's connected to the vine and, and bearing fruit. Wesley said, a Methodist is one who has the love of God shed abroad in his heart by the Holy Spirit that's been given to him. The one who loves the Lord his God with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his mind, with all his strength. God is the joy of his heart and the desire of his soul. And his soul is constantly crying out, whom have I in heaven but you? And there's none on earth that I desire more than you. My God and my all. You are, my, you are the strength of my heart. And you are my portion forever. Are you that connected to the vine that gives you life? Where God is your God and your all? So that you can bear fruit for Christ in your life and through your life? No wonder Christ uses this analogy of the, the vine and the branches to explain his, the relationship between, between him and his followers. Because we're told that the strongest place on a grapevine is where the vine and the branches are attached to each other. Where that vine and branch are connected. That connection is powerful. We need to be connected to Christ. 
We also need to be connected to one another, helping each other bear fruit for Christ, helping each other listen to those promptings of the Holy Spirit and acting on them and, and encouraging each other to, to follow God's will, not each other, you know, not our own will. And we need to be connected to each other through Sunday school and small group and mission and all those things so that we can all grow closer to Christ. During the last week of Jesus' life, he wanted his disciples to understand a lot of things. And if you read those chapters in any of the Gospels, that last week of Jesus' life is filled with one teaching after another. From public teachings to private teachings with the disciples, one after the other. Trying to get them to understand so much. But here... In the moonlight on Temple Mount, with the moonlight bouncing off of that relief of vine and branches carved around the temple door, he tells them really the heart of it all, that their life should be connected to him, that he is the vine, they are the branches. And through that connection, that their life should bear fruit for the kingdom of God. Well, here we are on the last Sunday when, when we look at the I Am statements of Jesus and we hear him tell us the same thing. That we need to be connected to him. Deeply connected to him. So that through that connection, our life can bear fruit for the kingdom. So, how connected are you? How is your life bearing fruit for the kingdom? And what changes do you need to make to connect more fully with Christ? To allow his teachings to inspire your life? To follow his will over your will. And to bear fruit for him each day. <coughs> Jesus said, I am the vine. And you are the branches. If you remain in him, he will remain in you. And then you will bear much fruit. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.